Hey friends, welcome back to Make Anything. I'm Devin, and this week we're going to be making another giant number. Last week you saw me make that crazy reaction diffusion number one carved on my CNC machine. And this week I'm going to make a giant number two. And I filmed it all so you can watch. That's right, this week I was asked to do another giant number, and this time I decided to do it using a thousand screws screwed into this painted plywood board. It sounds simple, but there's actually quite a bit that went into it, and I'm excited to share the process with you today. So, let's get right to it. Cool. All right, so here we are in Adobe Illustrator. Just like last week, I want to figure things out digitally first. And as you can see, I've already got my number here. It's already at the correct size. So it's time to start figuring out how I'm going to arrange all these screws. To do that, I first created this ellipse that's 10 millimeters in diameter. And that's going to represent basically the spacing I want between the screws. And this blue circle represents the pilot hole that I'll drill in order to put my screws in. So I'll group those to represent one screw. And from there, I'm just going to start duplicating this object over and over again to figure out the arrangement of all these screws. And at this point, I was just trying to figure out what the best way to fill this number two with screws would be. So I tried to do all sorts of things from randomly packing the screws to making a very organized grid. And I found that my favorite arrangement was actually a kind of combination between the two with the border being very organized and orderly. And then I got a bit more randomized as I filled in the rest of the inside of the two. And I also got a bit more sparse towards the center just to create this interesting shading effect. Here you can see what I ended up with. And I have a few different arrangements based on colors of screws and colors of wood that I could use. And after a bit of back and forth with my client, we decided to go with this large yellow rectangle with black screws making the actual number. The next thing I want to do is prepare this for Fusion 360. So you can see I already split this rectangle into two parts because I'm going to need to split this into two to fit it on my CNC. And for all these screws, I'm going to do a little bit of a workaround that I figured out where I use this convert to shape feature and change all those circles into little tiny 0.01 inch rectangles. And what that does is basically create this little cluster of four points near the center of where each screw will go. And you'll see how I use that in Fusion 360 in just a moment. For now, I'll just convert everything into outlines and export this selection as a DXF file. And now in Fusion 360, I'll go ahead and use the insert DXF command to bring in that same file I just exported from Illustrator. Here it is. So I'll move that into place and then I'm going to start in this design workspace by just extruding these two rectangles that represent the two pieces of plywood we'll be working on. So I'll make two separate extrusions and each one represents a piece of wood. There we go, very simple. And that's actually all we're gonna model. Everything else happens in the manufacturer workspace. In this workspace, I'm gonna make sure that that DXF is visible because we're gonna be using all those points. And then I'm gonna start a setup for my first piece, which will be the bottom half. So I'll go ahead and under this model option, I'll select that rectangle. That's gonna be our stock. And I don't want any additional stock, so I'll select that option. Now let's adjust the work coordinate system so it matches the CNC. I'll go ahead and use this option to select the Z axis. And then I'll go ahead and select the Y axis being this long edge. And then for the box point, I'll go up here and hit that top left corner. So that corner is gonna be our zero point. That's where we'll zero in our CNC. And that's how we make sure that everything we program here lines up with the real piece of wood that we're cutting on the CNC. So now we've got our setup for this first part and we're actually going to use this drilling process instead of the standard clearing options that you normally use with a CNC. Today we're just drilling holes. So first thing I'll do is select the tool. I already brought in all the measurements for a standard eighth inch drill bit that I'll be using. So let's hit OK. And then here under geometry, we're going to use this selected points hole mode. 
And that's why I made all these tiny squares. Now we can select one of these points and that will represent the center of one of our holes. All these little squares are so small that it really doesn't matter which of the four corners you select, it'll make a hole in pretty much the right spot. That's the easiest way I've figured out so far to bring uh, points in from Illustrator. Anyways, now I'm just gonna go ahead and select one of the corners of every little square there. And as you can see, this yellow line keeps adjusting as I select the points. And that's Fusion 360 automatically creating the most optimized path for drilling all these holes. So that's pretty cool. All right, so now I've selected every hole that is gonna be drilled into this piece of plywood. And now there's only a few more settings to mess with. Under the cycle tab, there's different options for how you want the hole to be drilled, but we can just do a standard rapid in and out. Just one quick drill. And finally, let's go to the heights tab here where we'll make sure that the bottom of the hole will be at the bottom of the model. And for the top height, we'll select the top of the model. The feed height is five millimeters above the top and the retract height has to be higher than that. So we'll just make it six millimeters and the clearance height of 10 millimeters is fine for what we're doing here. Now you can see each of our points has this blue cylinder, which represents the actual hole that we're gonna be drilling. And we can do a quick look over to make sure everything's correct. And when it's good, we'll hit OK. From here, we can go over to the process here, right click it and select simulate. And that allows us to actually watch this simulation of what the CNC is going to be doing. So if we zoom in, we can see every single hole being drilled one at a time, following that optimized path that Fusion figured out. It's always a good idea to watch through the entire simulation just to make sure that there's nothing unexpected happening. And in this case, everything looks really good. So we'll just go ahead and repeat all of those processes for the second piece. And then we can select our processes and open up the post process tab and we'll post that, which basically saves it to our SD card, which we'll bring over to the CNC. Of course, before doing all this, I did a quick test piece on top of the test piece for the last number, and I just drilled a few holes to see what that's like. As you can see, everything looks quite nice. I'm just using a standard eighth inch drill bit here with my spindle set to a really low speed, and it's working really well. So now it's time to cut out the actual pieces of plywood for the final piece. First, I made my rough cuts using a circular saw, and then I brought that to the table saw to clean it up and bring it down to a size that fits onto my CNC. It's still larger than what the final size will be, and that's so I don't have to be exactly perfect with my positioning on the CNC. I can go ahead and trim things down afterwards. But for now, I'll go ahead and bring in my first process for the bottom. And once I make sure everything is correctly set up, I'll go ahead and start that cycle. There we go. Holes have been made and now there's nothing left to do but cross our fingers and let the CNC do its thing. The bit was squeaking a bit, but it didn't seem to affect the holes. And after about 40 minutes of drilling holes, the process was complete without any issues. Lovely. Now let's do the second half. Once that half was completed, I brought them both to the workbench and now it's time to trim everything down and actually align it and stick these two parts together. So I plotted out my lines, took it to the table saw and carefully made my cuts. It's definitely nerve wracking since you pretty much have one shot, but luckily everything worked out as well as I could have hoped. To combine my two pieces of plywood, I made three pocket holes and screwed those parts together along with plenty of wood glue. I wiped away that excess glue and then clamped everything together just for good measure. And after 12 hours, I was ready to keep working. I still had to trim the sides, which is pretty tough with a part this large. So I started out with this hand router just to make a rough cut that's good enough to bring over to the table saw 
where I can do my final cuts that are nice and clean. And now on the back, I'm gonna go ahead and plot out where I wanna put a frame. So basically, I'm gonna create this frame of two by twos that will help raise the back off of the wall and give me a bit more structure. So I cut down those two by twos, and then once again, I'm gonna be using this pocket jig, which drills these holes at a very specific angle. And if you're into woodworking at all, you've probably already heard a lot about these pocket holes because they're really a super easy and fantastic way to join pieces of wood without having unsightly screws or anything like that. Those pocket holes with a bit of glue make for a really strong connection. Once I've finished assembling that little frame, I'll apply plenty more wood glue. And then this time around, I'm just gonna use a pneumatic nail gun to nail that frame to this wood board. And of course, I made sure that the nails were just the right length to connect the two parts together without going through the front. All right, now these two pieces of plywood are one. The seam is nearly invisible, but just to make things absolutely seamless, I'm still gonna sand down that surface and use a bit of wood filler to close all those gaps. And I actually ended up doing it all around the side of the plywood as well, since there's quite a few holes like this. And just generally, I wanted to smooth out that grain that's all around the sides. So after doing that, I'll go ahead and sand down my edges as well as that top surface down to about 220 grit. And then once that's nice and smooth, I'll dust it off and start applying the paint. Once again, I'm using a nice dense foam roller to apply my paint. And unfortunately, I let the paint guys at Lowe's convince me that I shouldn't get the absolute highest quality paint, which I really ended up regretting because it took a lot of coats of paint to finally cover up all the little knots and lines that were on this plywood. I'd say it was probably a good 10 coats. And after a bit of accelerated drying, I went ahead and did a bit of sanding with some 320 grit sandpaper. And I did that just to generally smooth out the paint and also to help better hide that seam between the two pieces of plywood. You can't really see it on camera, but I found it necessary. By the way, my pro tip for this video is that if you want to really upgrade your sandpaper, just cover the back with duct tape. It makes it more stiff and durable and easy to work with. It's a pretty awesome trick that I don't hear too often, so definitely try that out. Also, this video is unofficially sponsored by these scissors that I'm using. They're super cool. They have a special coating made specifically for cutting tape. I didn't know there was such a thing, but if you work with tape a lot, they're awesome. Check out the link in the description if you want a pair for yourself. After I finished my sanding, I went ahead and did another coat or two of paint just to make it all nice and perfect. And once that was dry, it was time for the polyurethane top coats. Once again, I used this spray polyurethane. I applied three good coats to make sure this thing is nice and protected. I left that polyurethane to dry until the following day and then it's time to screw. So I picked up 1200 of these nice black Torx screws and I'm really glad I went with the Torx head because it makes it just that much easier to screw these in. And whenever you're doing something a thousand times, you wanna make it as efficient as possible. And now the satisfying time-lapse. All right, that was exhausting, but the number is looking great, so totally worth it. I'm just about done at this point. I just need to put a bit of hot glue on some of the pointy parts that went through the back just to make sure it's completely safe. But once I've done that, we've got a nice, great big number ready for mounting on a wall. And I'm really happy with how it turned out. Now, I know a few people out there have been a bit bummed that I'm using all this fancy, expensive equipment that most people don't have. But if you think about it, something like this could be accomplished with a lot less. If you find a piece of wood that's already the size you want, all it takes is tracing out your design, 
manually drilling some pilot holes and then putting in screws and you've got something quite a bit like this. Of course, I'm doing this for commercial purposes, so I'm gonna use all the tools at my disposal. And boy, am I glad I had all those tools. That's it for today's video. I've got plenty more numbers on the way, so keep an eye out. I'm Devin, this is Make Anything, and as always, Stay inspired.